Hello, Nuggets. So I want to do a quick video, uh, a little blog about uh, Vietnam. We went there uh, last year, or two years ago now, beginning of last year. Um, and I never mentioned it, I don't think, in any of the videos. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Vietnam. I know we can't travel at the moment, really, with COVID. Well, we can, but it's difficult. Uh, but if you're planning a trip uh, and you're not sure where to go, I have to highly recommend Vietnam. Uh, it was, it's a stunning place. It's a stunning place and one of the best trips we've ever taken. It's really affordable. So you can take a trip that feels like real luxury for a very affordable amount. We splashed on the tickets, but you can get cheaper tickets and it is a long flight. So if you can handle getting the flight out the way, the actual stay in the country is amazing. And it's a touring stay. You don't really want to stay in one city. I mean, you can, but there's so much to see uh, throughout Vietnam that it's a, we did, south to north um you can do either way you can do whatever you want but it's such a wonderful trip so i wanted to go over a couple of the highlights um and uh tell you a few things about it okay so let's see where should we start let's start with the food because <laughs> i'm a foodie because i'm an addict right the food is unbelievably good like it's the best for country food the only place i think that compares to it me for me was france and in some ways, I think it's better than French food because the French f food, after a while, the richness starts to weigh you down. Like, it's, their food is heavy in France, man. It is rich, and it's relentlessly rich. So um, I don't know of many great French salads. Maybe there are, and I just don't know them. But it's a little rich, whereas the, the Vietnamese food, it has a lot of French culture um, because the French were obviously uh, were colonized the country for a long time. But also... Uh, it's got the Asian flavor as well. So it's like French Asian cuisine. Really what's happened in, in Vietnam is that the French was there so long that it's become part of the culture that you learn how to cook, right? And the variety of what they can cook. The Vietnamese chefs in general are just unbelievable. They can do anything. Like if you want to go get a really good pizza, like I was in um, Kathmandu, I was in Nepal many, many years ago, and I ordered a pizza for the fun of it, and it was truly appalling. It was Nepalese pizza, and it was just, you know, it was awful. Vietnamese pizza is one of the best pizzas I've ever had. It was just an amazing pizza. You have omelets or scrambled eggs or burgers, or or you have, like, French cuisine. You have, like, um, beef wellington, or you have some English stuff. Whatever it is, they're just incredibly good cooks. So they can basically cook anything. And the variety of restaurants is astonishing, right? And then on top of all of the fact that they can do international cuisine extremely well at an extremely high standard, Vietnamese food is delicious. <laughs> it's absolutely delicious. And, you know, I've known a few people. My, um, my father-in-law, he's not really my father-in-law. I call him that, Jerry. But um, I think of him like my father-in-law, um, was really worried about the food. Right, because he's not crazy about Asian cuisine. It's not his thing. He likes steaks. He likes potatoes. He likes, you know, he's pretty straightforward with what he likes. And um, he loved the food. He was worried about it before the trip, and he came back. He said, "Yeah, the food's incredible. They're just amazing at what they do. And like spring rolls, they're deep fried spring rolls. They're banh mi's. They're sandwiches. Just everything. The food is just amazing. Just go there just for the food, apart from anything else." We, never, we didn't have one bad meal, and we had some meals that just blew our mind. There was one in one of the cities I'm going to talk about that we both thought, Laura and I thought, might be the best meal we've ever had in our lives, in this tiny little place in, uh, where was it, in Hoi An. Anyway, we'll get to that. Uh, the people. So I know everyone says this when you go abroad. You're like, oh, the people were so nice. Vietnamese people, like, I fell in love with so many people out there. It was kind of extraordinary. Like, we had tour guides wherever we went, right? We Because it's so cheap. And I'm not normally a tour guide person, but, you know, we don't know, we don't speak Vietnamese. I can count to 10 in Vietnamese. That's about it and say thank you. But we don't know Vietnamese. We didn't know that much about the country. And you want to give money to a country that is a third world country, right? So you want to support it in any way you can. So we got a tour guide. The tour guides we're still Facebook friends with. My wife still texts one of them occasionally. Like, I give an example. <laughs> We're on, I'm on the back of our tour guide scooter. Our tour guide, there were two of them taking us one day in this city. And we're riding on the back of their scooters. They're just tooling us around on their scooters. And we're driving across this bridge. And my tour guide, Tim, 
um, T-I-M-H, Tim, that kind of Tim, uh, said, um, do you know the Beatles? And I said, yeah, of course I know the Beatles. I'm, I'm gripping onto the guy. We're, we're riding along the bridge as twilight's falling, the sun's setting. He said, you know the Beatles? I said, yeah, I know the Beatles, of course. He went, let's sing Beatles. And then he just started singing, and I joined in, and we're riding across this bridge in the middle of Vietnam, outside of a city, and just belting out Blackbird <laughs> as loud as we can. The, the trip was filled with moments like that. We just kept meeting people who were so warm and inviting. I did gardening with this little Vietnamese farmer who was about four foot seven, four foot eight. Literally, I weighed at least three times as much as him. You know, I'm just this huge, massive, fat American. I mean, he thought I was American. And I, but we're digging fields together. I just started to help him dig fields. And like, I did it wrong. And he took the shovel and he went, and he showed me how to do it. And like, it all feels like in retrospect, it's easy to, be cynical about it and say it's very touristy but actually what it was was that you could tell the people who were doing their job the tour guides and the people they were taking us to were just genuinely warm lovely people and we felt that absolutely everywhere they're really talkative very honest like fiercely honest I really felt that like no one ever tried to rip us off anywhere it was extraordinary I don't think I've ever been on a vacation where no one's tried to rip us off but no one did you know, we'd stop at a market and they'd see instantly there were tourists. We're the only guy there was a tourist and they charge us the price that everyone else paid. And I'm just not used to that. It doesn't happen in London. It doesn't happen in LA, you know. So very approachable, beautiful people. God, I love the Vietnamese. Such nice people. Um, the countryside. Okay, so it's stunning and it's lush and it's green and it's really varied. There's a lot of diversity in it. So like when you're down in Saigon, you have the, the Mekong Delta, which is this these tributaries of this estuary of rivers, and this beautiful, like almost swamp-like at times, like a bayou. They've got the big mangrove trees, and you can take boats going through, weaving through these areas that were probably terrifying during the Vietnam War. Um, oh, I've got to mention women. Oh, right, anyway, but the Mekong Delta, um, and there are these women who are, basically rowing you they do all of the boat tours it's all women who do the, the Mekong women do all of the tourism so they're just pushing this boat like incredibly strong and butch and talking through and they're singing to themselves while they're doing it and you turn around and look at them and they're like hello and they carry back to singing and it's just this beautiful thing framed within this lush green vibrant it, it literally vibrant as in vibrating like it feels like the whole t uh, country is humming with life and it's beautiful and then you go out to the big terraced peaks and you go out to the lakes and there's beautiful beaches up in Natrang and places like that it's got everything you could ever want you can travel around the country and see everything it's kind of like California in that respect it doesn't look like California but I have the same love for California because everything you could possibly see in nature yeah exaggerating obviously but it's all within two hours of you and it feels like that in Vietnam it's just stunning that those every place you go is photogenic and it's really beautiful so there's that the food people countryside okay insert on the women god it's bright in here um because i mentioned it and then didn't talk about it the women in vietnam were extraordinary like a, i think maybe three or four days into the trip laura decided she wanted to do a photo journal on the women of the country because they had such an impact on her so she spent most of the trip seeking out photographs of women, of Vietnamese women, because they're just extraordinary. They're just, they're powerful, they're strong, they're resilient. So much of the work is done by women. Uh, women. I mean, when you're out during the day, the people you see working are women. It's women doing all the tour guides, or a lot of the tour guides. Uh, we had men as well, but there are a lot of women tour guides. Women run in the market stalls. Women row in the boats. Women pulling in the fishing nets. And you just felt this feminine energy. And I'm not a woke guy, right? But you could not deny that the women of Vietnam are running that country, man. It's their extraordinary. And it really had a profound effect on Laura. She's like, I, I can't believe these women. They're just everywhere and they're the life force of this country and they're beautiful and they're they're they're, they're authentic and they're hard working 
and and yet they have that tender feminine warmth to them and so and i think that really the the men are very like that as well they have a very feminine energy is a lot of warmth to them as well so i think that feeling pervades across the country i think that's what we felt while we were there and one of the reasons we fell in love with it is you know it felt very gentle and yet the women there are robust and strong and not to be fucked with right like the the women in the mekong delta um there are tribe and i don't know what they're called their tribal name is but the women of the mekong delta they all wear very the same outfits they wear black and where they have the the i'm blanking on words but they have the hat that you've seen in every vietnam war movie uh coolie hats that kind of thing they're not coolies i think it's chinese but they have the vietnamese hats and they have like black pants and black shirts and they're out there working in the outfit every day and they're pulling in fishing nets and you just feel like this country would grind to a halt without the women in this country and it's beautiful and if you talk to the women in this country they're like yeah we run this country and they're not saying it in an arrogant way it's just a fact you know there's there is a problem with men and alcoholism but i also think most of the men are working construction right or a lot of men i don't know i'm really generalizing here but from a tourist point of view walking around our interaction most of it was with women because it's the women who run the shops, it's the women who run the, who are all doing the services, the women who are doing the street food, the women who are doing the waiting, the women who are doing the rowing of the boats, the women who are pulling in the fishing stuff, I mean the women doing the crafts, so you really feel that powerful and I got to talk about the cost because that was an important part for us, we, Laura's always had a dream of traveling first class, now we can't quite afford first class but we bought business class flights to get to Vietnam and they were really expensive right because flight travel is not cheap no matter what um, I think we paid like six thousand dollars <laughs> yeah for both of us total for for business class I mean it, it was it was the highest class that, that airline had it felt like first class to be honest with you food whenever you want it and it was beautiful and we really enjoyed it Laura said it was the best six thousand dollars we've ever spent but the reason that we could afford those seats was because the trip itself for two weeks was so cheap. Like the tour guides were cheap and like, we're not talking like ridiculous cheap where it costs a dollar to buy a hotel. You know, it's not like Nepal was like that, was, dirt, was ridiculously cheap. But it is so affordable. Like you could do that trip cheaper than you could go to Catalina Island here. Cheaper than you can go to Cabo. <laughs> like apart from the flights, you know, Cabo's expensive and places in Mexico are expensive now. And the restaurants and they char upcharge tourist areas. Vietnam is just cheap everywhere you go. And you can afford a tour guide to literally, like we had a tour guide for, I think, every day but two days. So like 12 of the 14 days we had a tour guide. And it was because it was so cheap and so easy to organize beforehand. And I was really nervous because when I first emailed the tour guide, the tour company, and said, you know, this is what this is. What, these are the places we'd like to see. The woman there, um, Joanna, I think her name was, texted, uh, emailed me back and said, "Let me work on this. I'll send you something back." So she sends me back a suggested itinerary and says, "Just so you know, everything's flexible. You're basically getting our tour guide to be with you, and they will do whatever you want. They want them to sit by the pool. They'll do that. If you want to go to ten different places and only spend three minutes in each, they'll do that. You're literally it's like a butler. It's like having a valet or a personal concierge just following you around." Or they can take over the trip. But all of that is affordable because of how cheap the country is, right? Insert why I was nervous. I never mentioned it. I'm just watching the video back. Um, I was nervous because we paid up front. And my cynicism said, wait, I don't know anything about this company. I'm going to pay up front. And they said the guy will just meet us there. The first, All of the tour guides will just meet us there, but I'm going to pay up front. But I took the plunge. A friend of mine, someone we knew, said, just do it. It will be okay. And it was. So just so you know, if you book a tour guide and they ask for payment up front, my story of that was, yes, I was really nervous, but I trusted it. And um, yeah, it worked out fine. Back to the story. And like just meals are cheap. You know, the both of us would, would feed for $10 and we'd have an incredible meal. I think the most expensive meal we had in Hoi An was about $35. And it was a it was like it should have had a michelin star it was that good and everyone eating there was looking was eating and then looking around going amazing look at this it's incredible and they had this incredible wine list as well like a french restaurant wine list they had with bottles all over the wall and we're like that's a that's a chateau brion not chateau brion that's a steak uh, a rothschild it was amazing 
So the cost. The other thing is that, and some people find this difficult, everything is negotiable. Honestly, at that cheap, what's the point? But occasionally you might feel that something is being overcharged and you can just negotiate, right? Like the taxi, some have... Um, meters right and some are just people driving around like an uber but without a service and you just wave them down and they stop for you now when you get in they won't start the meter you they'll say where to and you'll say i don't know manhattan hotel whatever uh and they'll say um i can't remember the currency now was it dong they might say 500 dong or whatever it is and you can choose whether to take it or not here's the thing that i found amazing the price they were asking for you you for was usually less than the meter and they didn't recognize or they did recognize that we were american or at least not vietnamese and their first offer was not five thousand dong it was less than what the meter would cost and it just shows a lot about the people and the way they are and it just means there's no stress you just go out i could cry thinking about it it's so beautiful you just have a really stress free trip because no one's trying to rip you off <laughs> it's extraordinary you know and then you tip really well and i think they know that the westerners tend to tip really well so they don't fuck you around and they know they get a really good tip which is probably more than they would have got if they just tried to rip you off it's extraordinary so very affordable everything is negotiable which can be a little difficult for some people at first but know that the negotiation tactic is usually fairly balanced you know the first offer you're getting might be a little bit above at most but if you don't negotiate, if they come at a price and you just say yes, you've not been ripped off. And that's a beautiful feeling. That's an, there aren't many countries in the world you can say that about. Uh, the hotels. Okay. <laughs> God, I'm really gushing about this country now. It's all coming back to me. They were unbelievable. Like, we were staying in five-star hotels for the cost of a one-star hotel in the U.S. It is so incredibly cheap. And the level of service is out of this world the one problem with the hotels is that some of them are a little old and run down and, and past their years and then people come in and build new hotels so it's not like the whole country is falling apart but like there was one we stayed at i think it was called the majestic or something and it was in hue city and it's one of the most famous hotels in vietnam and it was started by a french couple back in 1920 or 1910 back when the city was just dirt roads you know, it, there's an imperial temple there, so it's been a city for centuries. But it was a very loose city. It wasn't paved roads or anything like that. And they started this hotel, and they were French colonists coming in, and the wit, like, who are these people, you know? Um, that hotel you can stay in, it smelled a little bit moldy. Not going to lie, it smelled a bit damp. But you kind of accept that because you're staying in a piece of history. I mean, I felt that in France. We stayed in hotels in France that smelled in damp. There was one we stayed in Gascony that we went because of my name. We stayed out in Gascony that was um, that stank to high heaven. But this hotel was incredible. It had pianists at the bars. It had like big verandas. They had all of these traditions going back hundreds of years about high tea and French service. And they play mu movies out on the patio and this beautiful pool outside and just extraordinary colonial looking uh, hotel at dirt cheap prices. And you can stay anywhere. I mean, you don't even have to book anything. Right, you can. They, sometimes it gets busy and packed, but you can just go into a city or into a town and find a hotel. You wouldn't need to organize anything in Vietnam, which is what makes it so incredible. You could literally get a flight, get off at Saigon, maybe book your first hotel just so that you've got a place in Saigon or in Hanoi, depending on where you go. Which whether you go north or south, south or north, book that hotel, and then the rest of it, just wing it. Hotels everywhere. Everyone's really nice. If there's not hotels, people will let you sleep on their floor. It's that kind of place. It's my friend Jarrett did a tour where a motorbike tour across the country, he said was the greatest trip he's had in his life, where they literally slept on people's floors. You know, the tour guide had organized it. He just said, like, can we stay here? And they're like, yeah, okay. Can we eat with you? Yeah, okay. Oh, my God. So hotels are amazing. I talked a little about the tour guides, but just, again, to reiterate, I'm not a tour guide person. It stresses me out having a tour guide. I now feel that I have to put on an act for that person. Like, that's my issue, not their issue. But I feel that I have to be personable and nice and cheery and like, uh, I'm, I'm the clown, that's me. I'm, I'm the clown. I'm the rejuvenile delinquent. And that is exhausting being that person, right? And at 50 years old, it's getting more and more tiring being that person. But I didn't need to do that with the tour guides there because 
they just became friends very quickly. We were just very warm to each other. Like, hello, how you doing? Okay, um, you know, do you want to spend more time here? They, You could change the plan, last minute's notice. One of them, we're just like, we just want to stay here for an extra couple of hours. Okay, I'm going to go sit over there. Do you want me with you? No? All right, I'm going to go sit over there. Just come find me when you're done. And they're totally flexible on all of that. And I think it's because they expect everyone to be nice back to them. Like, there's just an assumption that everyone will be polite and charming and kind in return for what they put out. So if you're rude to them, I think I, th that doesn't enter their thoughts. They're not defensive when they meet you. They're open, embracing. And the tour guides were like that. They're, they're also extremely professional. So, you know, it, I found this actually a lot in third world countries and in communist countries, actually, in particular, that um, being a tour guide is a, a very highly cultured profession, right? Highly curated profession. Like you have to get your permit. You have to go to class. You have to make sure you're telling the right things to the right people. You need to know everything. I mean, it's a highly respected job being a tour guide. And we felt that in Vietnam. We felt that as warm and as kind and as embracing as they were, they knew their stuff. Like we had, one of our tour guides was an eco-tourist outside, where were we? we were near Da Nang at the point, at that point. And she knew everything about the agricultural economy and the ecology of Vietnam. And it was astonishing. And this girl had two jobs. She was training to do some other job, three jobs. She was at school training for something else. She was also, I think she worked in laundry or something. Um, she took us to her house, by the way. <laughs> That's how warm they are. She said, like, I live near here. Do you want to see how Vietnamese people live? And we're like, yeah. <laughs> so we drove to her house and she showed us around. She was so proud of it, you know. Um, it wasn't a nice house either. It was, it was cheap. It was poor. But she was so warm and welcoming. Um, but I, I think that... Why was I telling you that? Okay, her, her depth of knowledge about her, her chosen area of tourism, eco and agriculture, eco-agra, I think they call it, or agro-eco, um, just so deeply knowledgeable and so proud of it. And again, there's, a, there's one thing, one story I have to relate that actually might sound, as they're saying it, it might sound terrible, but it was beautiful at the time. She took us to see this old farmer and his wife this guy was easily 100 years old. So was his wife. I mean, ancient, ancient, tiny, like four foot two, shrinking a lot, right? Really small guys like here. Yeah, where are we? <laughs> um, absolutely tiny guy. And she said, you know, they've been featured in a lot of books. So there's lots of images. One of them was from Heart of Darkness, I think, or from it was some book about the film, about uh, Apocalypse Now film. And they were in that picture and then there was another one from national geographic and she showed us pictures of that and they have a book that they show to tourists to show the famous photographs so they're kind of mini celebs right and uh i think laura said can i take a picture and they said of course yeah you know she, 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 he just nodded didn't speak english but she said yeah take a picture so we take a picture and we just start walking away and they smile and they wave and we're walking away and our eco tourist our tour guide i think her name was min Min, um, said, said uh, you know, normally people donate for that. If you want to donate, well, like, oh my God, yeah, I'm sorry, how much did you donate? And she said, well, you know, $5 is a lot of money, that would really help. So we gave them $5 for a picture. But the way the interaction unfolded felt so wholesome. It was like, literally, as we're walking away, she's just like, well, we could just walk away. Should I tell them? You know, they survive. Actually, she also said they survive on donations. A donation is normally given, and they do survive on donations. They're too old to farm now. Oh, God, how much? $5 is a good amount. You can give whatever you want. You can give $100 if you want. But $5 is a, is a very reasonable tip. I don't know. Just the way it unfolded felt so healthy and so kind and so direct and about that clearly this tour guide was really looking after the people on her tour. She obviously goes there a lot and she feels community with all these people. She's waving at everyone, they're waving at her. She stops and has a chat, not related to us with someone, talking about some fish that are in a pond and like, I don't know, just so natural and so healthy, it was beautiful. All right, stop gushing about that. I wanna talk about the highlights. So these are the cities that I think you must go to. We did South to North. And we loved it, to be honest with you. I thought it was a beautiful way. It depends. If you want to party at the beginning, 
Go south to north if you want to party at the end. Go north to south. Because Saigon is the city which has a great nightlife, right? We did south to north. We're not partiers, but, you know. So the highlight, Saigon. So, like I said, great nightlife, really busy metropolis. Uh, there's lots to see. Um, everywhere in Saigon is kind of like a walking city, but it's also great for scooters and stuff like that. But Saigon is very westernized. A lot of western influence. And there's also some amazing sights to see in Saigon. So... Our tour guide for Saigon, we were there for two days. So they did Saigon and they took us to the Mekong Delta. His name, whose name I can't remember now. Is it David? Dick? Dick? No, Dick. I can't remember his name. Was. Anyway, the guy who... Uh, that's going to annoy me. Nick? Anyway, the guy who's going to uh, who took us around Saigon, like one of the things he did was he took us to the rooftop in Saigon where they, um, where they uh, uh, evacuated the final CIA members from the roof, that very famous picture on the roof of the helicopter landing. So we were on that roof. So here's an example of how Saigon, how Vietnam changed me. When he said he was going to take us there, my instinct was, this is a lie. It's not really the place. And they're just going to, it's going to look kind of vaguely simmer and they're going to hope I don't remember. And I probably won't, right? We get there. No, it's the real place. And it's not a tourist spot. He tells us to stand around the corner or across the street and watch him as he goes up to the security guard and he says he wants to go up to the top and the guy says no and they're not acting. (laughs) They're not acting. And then he pulls out some money and he gives it to him and he says, please. And the guy says, okay. And as we walk by, as we walk in, the guy says, our tour guide just says, don't look at him, just walk into the elevator. So we just ignore the guy. We walk into the elevator and I say to him, how much was it? What, What can we reimburse you? And he says, oh, don't worry. It was very cheap. It was very cheap. So they didn't do all of that scam to get money off of us. He didn't ask us for money. (laughs) He just did it, you know. Get it up to the roof, and it's genuinely where the evacuation was taking place. And it also happens to have a beautiful view of the city. So Saigon is amazing. It's got a lot of those things. The whole country has a lot to do with the war, the American war, they call it. Um, Well, obviously they would. What else? Um, American colonist war, maybe? I don't know. It's got a communist twin, uh, tilt to it. Um, but Saigon is beautiful for the nightlife, and they've got some big towering buildings there, and lots of clubs and great hotels and street food and markets and energy. It's just a real energetic metropolis. You could spend a lot of time in Saigon. It's really beautiful. There's lots of place, things to see there. Um, my favorite place on the whole trip was a place called Hoi An. So Hoi An kind of feels like Venice, Right? It's got a big river with some little canals running through it. It doesn't really look like Venice, but it has the same vibe. Like This is where we had our best meal either of us have possibly ever had. We would go back to Vietnam just to go there. But the main river with the canals, like they do this thing every sunset where they light candles with little paper lanterns around them and float them down the river. So every night there are thousands of little lights floating along the river. And all of the streets, there's no cars. They can go around in the perimeter in the cars and scooters, but nothing, all the middle is all walking areas. And it's all these tight little alleyways with like little shops in them and buildings just erected, however, haphazardly. And then you turn a corner and suddenly you're on a main street and there are cars that are cutting across the city, but then you go back in. It kind of reminded me of Tamil in Kathmandu, like Old Town. It's Old Town Hoi An. And in all of these alleyways are all these incredible restaurants and stores. And one of them, while we're sitting there having had the best meal of our lives, I turned to Laura and said, it feels like we're in Venice. Because the next building is over there. There's people walking by an alleyway, just kind of looking in through. There's no window. It's just shutters, right? It's open shutters, walking by and going, how is it? And we're going, oh, amazing, come in. Just beautiful. Service was great. Everything was clean. You know, everything's polite. You know, would you like to see the wine menu? It's French service in this tiny little hole in the wall restaurant. It felt like Venice of the North, Venice in Asia. Absolutely beautiful. Um, oh, and arts and crafts. The arts and crafts in Hoi An were amazing as well. And we stayed in this incredible hotel just off of the river beyond the final bridge of the river before it turns out into the countryside, there's this hotel that just looks out over the whole city. And all you see is these old temples and pagodas and and ancient wood structures and people walking through the streets through these tiny little cobbled stone alleyways. And, oh, stunning. So that's Hoi An. 
Uh, Ninbin. So Ninbin is kind of like Halong Bay. And Halong Bay, if you don't know what that is, you would know the picture. It's those weird towering rocks in a big lagoon. If you know that image, so there's these weird odd rock structures just sticking out of the water. So Halong Bay, when we were doing our tour guide, I said I wanted to go to Halong Bay before we left to, in the email. And Joanna, the uh, the tour organizer, said we can absolutely do Halong Bay. We have multiple options here, but you might want to consider going to this other place because it's less touristy and everything you've recommended so far has been less touristy. So she said Ninbin. And we, I looked it up and I'm like, wow, yeah, so we'll go there. And it looks kind of like Halong Bay. It's smaller version, but there's no tourists. So it just feels very more um, intimate, right, and very close. And it was beautiful. Hardly any tourists, amazing scenic views, monkeys and goats and things everywhere, just like wildlife everywhere. And we took a boat ride through one of their lagoons, through some of these rocks and these mountains and these cliffs, and the person riding, driving the boat, wait, what do you call that? The, the, the boat steerer was a woman sitting in a chair and they sit in a chair like this and they row with their feet like this. A lot more gracefully than I'm doing it. They, it's not a pedal boat though. It's oars that they're pushing with their feet and they strap their feet to it so they can pull it back. And that's literally how they row their boat, just with their feet. And they do that for like an hour. <laughs> An hour, these people have incredible legs. And you go, like, through past these cliffs. There's one point where you go under this, like, this low-hanging rock. It's kind of terrifying. You're in the water, and as you're getting close, this woman goes, uh-oh. You look round, you look back, and you're just seeing this dark tunnel. You're like, we're going into this cave. Where are we going? And then as you go in, the voices echo out, and you can touch the rock above you, and there's a pinprick of light in the distance, and you know that's where you're heading. All of these burned photographs in our head just these memories intense memories um and that's what ninbin was it was just uh, absolutely beautiful also happened to have the best ice cream we had in Viet uh, vietnam there <laughs> just so happened on the roadside whatever it was but it was just so good we just sat with our tour guide ninbin just eating ice cream it was beautiful because <laughs> we had when we took a big trip like we took first class flights which are cheap in country so it was like $150 to fly first class to plane hop, like a 30-minute plane ride from one city to another. I highly recommend doing that. It's so cheap. It's not first class, but but it's nice. You get a nice seat, a big seat, and it's so cheap. So as we hopped to Ninbin, for example, at the airport to meet us, or at the hotel the following day to meet us, was uh, our tour guide just sitting down, just texting on their phone, like, hey, how you doing? Like, let's go. Can't wait. I'm out. How are you? And, you know beautiful such a beautiful thing so that's ninbin um hue city was laura's favorite now i think laura really liked hue city because it's an ancient city so it's got the imperial temple and stuff like that that's thousands of years old but on the other side of the river is a metropolis is a built-up metropolis but it has very wide roads and it's very scooter friendly so laura and i drove scooters everywhere through hue city and it was so much fun that and we got to really experience city culture in Hue, more than Saigon because we were it was new, right? And more than Hanoi because Hanoi is the north, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But Hue City, we were riding scooters everywhere, and we saw we went to markets in Hue City, and we bought some foods and some bits and pieces. We went to the cinema. We went to see Aquaman. So this dates when we went in. Um, wait, was it? It was. Dubbed? Was it dubbed into Vietnamese? No, no, no. It was in English, but it had Vietnamese subtitles. Otherwise, it would have been a nightmare. But that was fascinating. We do that all the time because we want to see what cinema culture is in other countries, right? And in Vietnam, it's kind of similar. They basically just sell soda drinks and popcorn, but they sell like 20 different types of popcorn. They do 10 different sweet flavors, 10 different savory flavors. That's, that's their thing, right? Flavored popcorn. Um, but Hue City was uh, lots of sites, really nice hotels there as well. Uh, again, very efficient city. So it's a good stop at a midpoint to kind of relax and say, okay, you know what, let's do some laundry. Uh, let's go check our emails and do our bank account or do anything you want to touch base with home. Hue City was a great place to do it because the hotels are all really modern. They've all got great Wi-Fi and they've got all of that kind of stuff, good restaurants and all that, but also still very affordable. And the city is really nice to walk around. And it's fascinating because on one side of the city is this metropolis 
And literally just across, you go into this old town, ancient Vietnamese world, which is beautiful, you know. There's not much of the palace left, the imperial palace left. It's kind of odd. It's basically a wall, and inside, lots of posters telling you what used to be there. But Hue City is beautiful, and it was Laura's favorite. And then finally, where we ended up, the end of the trip was Hanoi. So Hanoi was stunning for a lot of different reasons. So I really liked Hanoi as well. But we did some things there. So, for example, we went to the Vietnam War Museum, which is called the American War Museum, and got to see what the Vietnamese thought of the Vietnam War, or rather what the northern Vietnamese thought. Because in Saigon, in southern Vietnam, they're still very sympathetic. And in northern Vietnam, they're not anti-American. They love Americans. They really do, because they say Americans are the politest tourists. We asked. They told us, like, which are the worst, which are the best? Americans are the best. And I said, not the English, because I told him I was English. He went, no, no, English, not the best. No tip. (laughs) So the Americans, they love. But the Vietnam War Museum, the American War, Colonial War Museum, um, American Aggression Museum, maybe that's what it was called, had lots of, of equipment that was left over by the Americans when they left. Except it doesn't look like real equipment. It looks like they made models and tried to pass it off as real. It's all painted black for some reason. Like the tanks and the choppers and the jeeps, they're all just painted jet black. I don't know why, whether it's supposed to preserve it or something. But they've painted jet black and then they've put letters and numbers on the side of them to make it look like that's how the American vehicles look. And of course there's not. There's terrible typos in there like Air Force is spelt wrong. It's like Air Force with an S instead of a C. So clearly this stuff was made up, right? But then inside they have stories of the Vietnam War and probably less propaganda than you would expect. Although they do firmly lay the war at the Americans' feet because it's still a communist country. Most of it is just stories of horror of what people went through. And they don't necessarily say, look what the Americans did to us. They talk about just how difficult the war was for these people, you know? Beautiful museum in some ways, you know, a little disconcerting, but again, no one cares that you're American there. Even at the War Museum, they're like, hello, come in, yeah. It's totally forgiven, this is just our past. They call it, I think they call it red capitalism. It's like China. It feels like a capitalist country, but it's communist. But you don't feel that it's communist at all. I never got the sense of it being a communist country, except for the one place we went in at Hanoi, which was um, Ho Chi Minh's mausoleum. So we decided to go in. It's in the middle of this, just this incredible big piazza, very communist looking piazza actually, like Red Square or something, with lakes and buildings and mausoleums and all that. And in the middle of it is Ho Chi Minh's mausoleum. And there's a line, but it goes pretty quick. You don't stop in the mausoleum. You have to walk around at a pace, probably like Lenin. I don't know. It's probably the same. But that was weird. That was weird because when we got into the room to look at his body in a glass case, the smell was totally bizarre. It was like, um, it was metallic and it smelled like wax (laughs) and cold and just, it just felt, smelled deathly. It smelled like a mausoleum, which was kind of weird considering there are thousands of tourists going through it. It's open every day of the week. So millions of people have been through that building and it smells as if no one's been in that building. It's the weirdest thing. Um, I mean, it, it smells basically like maybe what embalming fluid smells like, although I don't know what it f- smells like, but it's weird. And his body looks very waxy, and both Laura and I were like, I don't think that's his body. I think that's literally a wax muse- a waxwork image. But I don't know. I don't know. Is Lenin's body really Lenin's body, or is it just, you know, a wax copy, a mannequin? Um, But that was a little weird. It felt communist in there because there are guards everywhere and they're watching you. They're not threatening, but they're watching you everywhere and no one stops. And, you know, you had that thing, I want to take a picture. I'm like, I'll take a picture. And the the guard just went, and that was it. I don't know. That was the closest I felt to any sense of oppression. But honestly, I feel that if I go to a place in America with, (laughs) I feel that when I walk past the TSA. So, you know, I didn't feel that different. Um, The best thing about Hanoi is, the two best things are, firstly, walking around the city was kind of like Hoi An, that's confusing, but a walking city, they have Old Town, which felt also like Nepal, like a Tamil in Nepal, 
beautiful tight little bent alleys with market stalls everywhere and and businesses on top of businesses on top of businesses so just one street you could spend all day walking down one street it was amazing and people going backwards and forwards on scooters and people asking you to come in eat in their restaurant it just felt vibrant and exciting and we bought some street food there and we tried it and it was delicious and like i'm bit wary and Laura's definitely a bit wary about street food because you know we don't have the gut bacteria to handle it a week in Vietnam two weeks in Vietnam you'll realize you don't need to worry about that it's so good the food is so good everywhere you go and Hanoi was no doubt was probably some of the best food apart from that one meal we had in Hoi An consistently Hanoi was just the Vietnamese food with actual Vietnamese cuisine in Hanoi was unmatched anywhere else delicious every restaurant and if you go to Yelp or the guide or the concierge and ask and say we want traditional Vietnamese food he's like just walk outside and pick the first place they're all amazing and they were everywhere we went was amazing um, so it's got great fascinating museums and culture Hanoi is a beautiful city you can kind of if you rent a scooter we rented a scooter to get out of the network of the myriad of alleyways and small streets you can kind of get out onto the main industrial city and get a little lost, right? Uh, there was one point, well, we didn't get lost here, but you can get onto a byway and we're like, where the hell are we going? Like, we're passing concrete factories now and steel mills and stuff like that. But everyone's warm and friendly. You can stop and just ask and say, how do I get back to Old Town? And they're like, oh, straight down, turn left. No. It's just so friendly. There was one point, this feels like India, where our tour guide in Hanoi took us along the train tracks he wanted to show us vietnamese life for the ultra poor right for the poorest of the poor and they live along the train tracks and they have a market along the train tracks and i'm sure some of you have seen videos online of similar things in india and other places but where when a train comes through they all back off they let the train through and then the stalls come out and the food comes out and the kids are playing and everyone's walking along it and tourists it's packed here's the thing it's absolutely packed and what's so interesting, maybe this happens in India as well, but the way the Vietnamese government has dealt with this is not to push them all away or to make it illegal. They installed an early warning light or lights along the train track. So there's a light and a light and a light way before the train gets there that go off and tell everyone to move their stuff out of the way. That's how they dealt with it. Just a sign of how beautiful the country is. I don't know, maybe, maybe I have low expectations of everywhere else. But I just, I would expect, if that was somewhere else, I would expect those people to get moved on, right? Because there's a lot of homeless. They're living in doorways and, you know, most of them have some form of roof over their head. But it's, it's the ghetto, right? It's the slums. And instead, what the government did was they put up a system to make sure they didn't get hit by trains. That was all they did. Other than that, and the police were there as well, by the way. Police are just walking along like they are everywhere else, buying food, just sitting down eating with the locals, you know beautiful <laughs> it's beautiful uh so that's about it that was a long video sorry about that but um i just cannot recommend going to vietnam highly enough go now i'm sure it will get ruined i'm i you know if i'd been making videos 25 years ago 30 years ago i'd have said go to vietnam uh, go to uh, nepal before it gets ruined because that was also equally beautiful but that was a rough trip right um but the point is, it did get ruined. It is very different now in Nepal. You don't get the same experience. Freak Street is gone, effectively. So it's a very different place. Plus, they had a huge earthquake in Back to Poor. But um, I feel the same about Vietnam. Like, I'm sure part of it has already gone, and people who went there 10 years ago say it's not the same. But right now, it is an incredible experience. Do it now before it disappears, as everything else will. All of these beautiful, traditional, antique ways of life the people are wonderful. It's a cheap trip. Book it.